Welcome to the Gruber Morning Show, our Artificial Future podcast, which is our AI podcast that we do every Wednesday morning. The um, image behind me, by the way, I never know which way to move. There we go. We have a human on an operating table. At least that's what I asked AI for. And if you look carefully, it's kind of like a robotic looking human, but it's supposed to be a human. The big news this week, of course, is the uh, Neuralink implant. Uh, and uh, it was the first device that was implanted in a live human subject. It was done Sunday, apparently. And uh, Elon uh, said that um, the patient is recovering well. Uh, he added that uh, the initial data from the, from the device was promising. Now, what this is all about is uh, Neuralink has been working for some time on this uh, capability, and they've um, had a chimpanzee test uh, subjects in the past, but this is the first human that, um, uh, that uh, Neuralink has actually uh, done. And um, this isn't the only brain implant, by the way, in the world. There are 42 of them, and later on in the discussion, we'll, um, we'll give some data about where, what, who, and uh, you know how long it's been done. But at least for uh, Neuralink, this is a first, and of course it made the headlines. Its intent is to uh, interpret a person's neural activity, of course, and it's placed in a region of the brain that plans movements. And um, so the goal is to, to control external devices, such as smartphones or computers, with their thoughts. And um, the device is currently in clinical trials, which is, um, uh, which is open to some individuals who have quadriplegia due to amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is known as ALS more commonly, or spinal cord injuries. People that have lost uh, movement, uh, the ability to, um, uh, to function or to move. And um, so this first Neuralink product is going to be called telepathy. And it will initially be used by people who have lost the, uh, their ability to use their limbs. If you remember, Elon had been talking about that for some time when questioned why, uh, you know, put chips in the brain. Uh, is, are there nefarious reasons for that, control issues? He says, no, we just want to uh, reconnect broken parts to give people functionality and uh, improve their lives. Uh, what, of course, can come later with this kind of technology buried deep inside our brains is the ability to uh, interface, to connect, to uh, communicate. And uh, so it has far-reaching implications. Um, they say that this um, uh, marks... Oh, he gives an example. He says, imagine Stephen Hawking could communicate faster than a speed typist or an auctioneer. Uh, that's the goal. And if you remember, the, um, Stephen, no longer with us on the planet, was a brilliant mind, a uh, great loss, and uh, definitely had, um, uh, you know, a slow communication method. But um, being able to give people like him the ability to uh, become 100% functioning again regarding communication, or in this case, 100% and beyond what we're accustomed to, would be a major uh, step in the right direction. They say the implant marks a significant step for Neuralink, which has faced regulatory hurdles due to safety concerns. Not uncommon. There are going to be a lot of, um, uh, a lot of regulators you know, concerned in uh, looking into something like this. Um, and there are several other companies that have been working on this, including BlackRock, Neurotech, and Synchron. And they have been testing brain implants on humans. Now, um, they talk about uh, Musk's endeavor with, uh, uh, with uh, Neuralink, and um, it was uh, hyped to suggest that it could be used to enhance human function more broadly. Well, of course, that's an understatement based on what uh, this kind of technology could potentially do. We've got an Instagram visitor, OxDZ213, says, Hello, it's a great project, as every Elon Musk project typically is. I agree with you. Guy just seems to think outside the box. You know, what was this tunneling thing all about? You know, we, we've, we've heard this before, but no one has actually ever made it uh, financially uh, possible. 
And uh, next thing you know, Elon's got a proof rock uh, uh, tunneling machine, and uh, he's busy tunneling under Las Vegas. Now he's going to be tunneling under Giga Texas, and uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, developments coming from uh, Elon and the companies. TikTok Smuggler sent us a gift. All right, thank you. How are you, Smuggler? You're always welcome on our shows. Um, so let's let's continue with the um, with the Neuralink uh, implant. By the way, we did a video. <clears throat> it's um, about a minute and a half, short, brief. It's one of the Pete Rance videos, which are intended to be humorous. And I think people misunderstood my humor in the video regarding the implant. And it's called Elon's Brain Implant. It's out on our YouTube channel, and uh, it. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of like a stand-up comedy routine, but only a minute and a half. Uh, in no way attempting to um, uh, you know, diminish the major technological advance that something like this represents. But um, again, my goal with these rants is to uh, put some sanity back into things that are oftentimes perceived as scary and uh, nefarious. And you know, um, like they were saying here, the regulators are now coming out in droves due to safety concerns and... Uh, um, but anyway, it says that um, on its website, Neuralink advertises its ambition of creating a technology to restore autonomy to those with unmet medical needs today and unlock human potential tomorrow. Um, and, you know, there's probably a dozen rabbit holes we could go down talking about the future implications of having this kind of technology, fundamentally a biointerface that would allow us to, um, through a uh, RJ45 plug or whatever, or Wi-Fi, be able to uh, link into the brain directly. All right. The, um, now, the company, they say, Neuralink, has faced obstacles that have critics skeptical of its goals. In November, four U.S. lawmakers asked the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, to investigate if Musk misled investors about the safety of his brain implant after, vet after veterinarian records indicated that experiments in monkeys resulted in debilitating health defects. That was according to uh, Reuters. In May, when uh, Neuralink said it had gained approval for human trials... Ryan Merkley, director of research for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, said, if Musk cared about the health of patients, he would invest in a non-invasive brain-computer interface. You know the naysayers are going to come out, all right? <clears throat> Neuralink did not respond to a request for this comment, they say. Now, again, at least 42 people worldwide, even before this Sunday event, have had brain-computer implants. The Washington, um, the Washington Post reported last year, including a paralyzed man who fist-bumped President Barack Obama with a robotic hand in 2016. So, although new, not quite that new. They say that uh, Neuralink's approach is more invasive and higher bandwidth than some of its competitors. Its aim is to transform data from the brain to the computer more rapidly. Of course, you would expect nothing less from Elon Musk and company. The device is sewn into the surface of the brain. And if you're curious what this thing looks like, Jesse, we've got a picture of it. If we can bring up the implant picture. I am working on that still. Give me one sec. Okay. And in the meantime, picture the guy behind me on the gurney there. He is getting the implant installed. Forget the smoke. I'm not sure that what, what AI was trying to tell us there. I don't think there was smoke during the operation when they put this implant into the live human. Unless um, that's a dull bit he's using into that. Uh... <laughs> you know, I always worry about that when I go to the dentist. They numb your teeth. Then if they're using a dull bit, they'll heat the hell out of your tooth, which, of course, can kill the nerve, right? So um, I usually ask for a nice sharp burr or bit before they start. Or bring your own file in case you need to sharpen <laughs> yeah. that up. <laughs> bring your own, right. Or suck on an ice cube while they're doing it. All right. So they say that uh, this device that will be up here shortly is actually sewn onto the surface of the brain during surgery. You're on the wrong uh, screen, uh, Jesse, or unless our audience can see that. 
He's still working on it. We we changed servers, by the way. Uh, social media had grown so much here that uh, we ran out of space, disk space. So um, over uh, the last few days, they've been changing servers, and uh, we've been having a few hiccups. There we go. We got it. Okay. Looks like a tiny little device, uh, you know, a little bit bigger than the guy's thumb, smaller than a wristwatch. And then you can see the, uh, the interface cable. Isn't that cool? I wonder if that's a plug-in socket. It looks pretty cool. It's it's going to be uh, weird looking back in this and looking back at these in ten to fifteen years and say, "Man, look how large that thing is." <laughs> and they actually used to put that into people's yeah, heads. What into were they brains. thinking? Yeah. <laughs> right. And it doesn't. Yeah. You know, these years, uh, ten years, or these days, ten years is a is a long time in the world of technology because it's it's improving and changing so rapidly. So they say that uh, this is sewn, of course, on the surface of the brain during surgery conducted by a robot. My first thought here was, wait a minute, don't they trust human surgeons anymore? And it immediately came to mind, I bet the machines are going to be more accurate, more reliable. Well, they're more steady, too. You don't have any yep. kind of human air of, like, you know, too much coffee in the morning or, so, you know. I right. mean, there's always going to be some kind of human element where a robot is going to be steady and safe, mm -hmm. you know, 90% um, of the time, probably even higher than that. Or an unexpected tick while he's, the, uh, you know, while he's in there with the scalpel. Or drank a little bit too much wine, uh, you know, the night before. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of variables. The machines just don't suffer from that kind of instability or unpredictability. But I found that interesting. It was uh, robots that actually sewed this onto the surface of the brain. In 2022, apparently Elon imagined or said that he imagined a future where people upgrade their brain chips. And I'm sure that you would not want an iPhone 1 stuck in your head if an iPhone 14 is available. Now, here we're talking about upgrades, right? It's going to be invasive because you've got to open up the skull again. You've got to open up the brain and get the newer version. But when I thought that through a little more carefully, this is, after all, Elon Musk, right? All right. Isn't it quite likely that he's going to be doing over-the-air updates? But will people who aren't, you know, people who don't like this technology, will they say it's a recall then? You know, that that's a good question, yeah. Uh, will NHTSA get involved and have a recall, a mandatory recall? And then what do you do? You drive yourself down to an operating Tesla center? Tesla service center. A, yeah, Tesla <laughs> service center. <laughs> if it's machines doing it, you know, they could potentially build that kind of infrastructure out there at a service center. But, yeah, all kinds of questions come to mind. I'm sure that the over-the-air updates is something that they will consider. A um, few comments here. Tom Jensen, that's from the joint that he's smoking, he says. All right. <laughs> Uh, the inspiration, I'm assuming, is what you're saying. And then we've got Ox DZ213. If this project implement the GPT-4 IA, the world going to change? Well, yes, the world has been changing rapidly. Uh, and then Tom Jensen says they do suffer from power outages. Oh, my God, what are you going to have, a uh, battery backup for your brain implant? That's where Gruber Power Services comes in handy because we can Thank provide you. that. Yes, we are in the uninterruptible power services business, and who knows, we may have uh, personal uninterruptible power systems that you can attach to your belt. To and, plug uh, yourself in at night. <laughs> plug yourself in at night, yeah. Uh, you know, that's where probably inductive coupling charging comes in handy. Uh, avoid the plug. Kind of intrusive, but yeah, I mean, again, a lot of rabbit holes here that we could go down, but the cool part is that someone has finally begun to do something about this and begun to explore this. They say that while most companies remain focused on therapeutic treatments, Musk has angled for a wider application, suggesting that the technology could be used to enhance human function more broadly. He's spoken of putting humans on path to symbiosis with artificial intelligence. Well, I'm not surprised there either. And suggested that he would get the technology installed in his own brain someday. Well, I think you guys have heard me enough times uh, talking about the fact that I'm an advocate for this kind of technology to the point where I also volunteer. I think that any of these kind of augmentations are going to uh, enhance and improve our quality of life. <clears throat> All right, let's see what else we have here. So if you could change one thing in your life right now, what would yeah. you hope that would be? 
Wow, that's like, a pretty broad question. Are you talking about going. Like with technology or what? With, the, with this Neuralink with implant. Neuralink? Yeah. With this Neuralink implant. Okay. Well, uh, my ultimate goal, and this has been for decades, is exactly what they're doing here, a biointerface. I, I think it would be cool to be able to connect to the kind of technology that we have, download memory, down, do a backup, basically, of our consciousness. And, of course, it gets much broader than that. The way we communicate currently by making guttural sounds that are different uh, on, every plan on, on every country on this planet. Uh, is highly inefficient. And, of course, a lot of misinterpretation takes place as a result of that. I think that direct communication, like they talk about here, telepathic communication eventually, is going to be far more efficient. Of course, now the privacy concern, people jump into the fray. Well, what happens to privacy? You know, um, all your thoughts will be public. Um, well, you know, we're going to have, those are the challenges we're going to have to resolve in the future. But again, uh, if, if, if I had a vote on any of this, I'm ready for some sort of technological leap where we as humans, uh, you know, exponentially increase our capabilities. We talked about this often. Remember the sensory input? All right. I mean, there are insects, for Christ's sake, they can see more than we can see. They see into the infrared world, you know. Um, there's nothing limiting us other than the hardware that we have evolved with that limit that. You provide technological augmentations, and now we can see well beyond. Remember the $6 million man, Lee Majors? Probably before your time, right? You used a little to be before my see, time, yeah. He used to be able to see a few miles away by just going boop, 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 and his eye would focus in like a telescope on something really far away. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question, I'm looking forward to these kind of augmentations. You could be able to speak every language. Speak every language. Or understand or every language. Yeah, or we have one language. The language of, uh, you know, tele human communication. I, I don't know what we would call it, but there would be no need for multiple languages. Of course, now the naysayers come in. Well, what about culture? Uh, well, we preserve the culture. You can still dance the Macarena wherever they dance that on the planet, you know? <laughs> um, or worship the way that you want. I mean, there, there are no limitations. But yeah, communication would be much more accurate and much less problematic. The majority of problems on the planet seem to come from miscommunication. You know, they got it wrong or hidden agenda or open agenda. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, a combination of those two. Um, but so anyway, does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, all right. Bronco Buster says, if you're going to put something of that size in me, then you better buy me a fancy dinner. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's about the size of a small wristwatch, based on what you see there, one of those little uh, uh, ladies' Timex watches. But it's first generation, guys. You know, we're talking about nanorobots eventually traversing our cardio system, uh, little ships that are actually looking for, uh, you know, various types of issues that are going on in our body. Tom Jensen says, imagine being able to see all people and thoughts. Not sure I'd want that. You'd have to have filters. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, Oz213 says, getting access to the whole Internet knowledge is so a utopia and can be scary. You know, there's, there's that metaphysical uh, thought concept about the Akashic Records, which is all of the knowledge that's ever been accumulated and having access to that instantly. Um, AI is taking us there. All right, so what else do, the, do we have here? Uh, yes, all right. So now here's a naysayer, and this guy's an attorney, Alan McKay. Uh, he's a fellow at the University of Sydney's Law School who studies ethical issues related to emerging neurotechnologies. He said in a phone interview that the idea of cognitive, en cognitive enhancement sparks concerns. A society where some people are cognitively enhanced and others aren't could create a class divide like nothing ever. All right, so we've got those people weighing in. Then he says, the rise of neurotechnologies, which also include external and recreational devices, such as gaming headsets, also raises more immediate issues about how to regulate the use of brain data. Don't you love that word? We want to regulate everything that we're afraid of, right? 
even if we don't understand what we're afraid of yet, we need to regulate. We need to have that in place first, right? Before we understand it, that is. All right. He also says that there will be a debate about these issues needs to become more prominent. But McKay also points out to a number of potentially positive applications of neurotechnology. Thank you. Here comes the good part. Such as treatments for severe depression, epilepsy, locked-in syndrome. Well, my God, there's probably another few thousand uh, types of ailments that something like this could begin to get a handle on. Um, think about how many people on this planet badly need therapy. And think about a device like this that has direct access to the stuff that's creating your need for therapy. That's just one example. You know, it's um, getting a little personal here. My uh, fiance's uh, son has... Um, um, he's a mild, I forgot how they put it, a mild, uh, spectrum of autism. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so it's Asperger's, mm -hmm. um, has some OCD issues that usually go coincide with that. It, it, something like this would, you know, I think would help him realize, Hey, you're acting a little, you know, here's the data. Here's what's going on. This is what we think, mm -hmm. you know, something to help him understand because the way he thinks is I'm perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with me. And there isn't wrong. He just does things a little differently. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that we're trying to get him to understand, Hey, the way you are doing things are causing you to, you know, X, Y, and Z causing these issues and stuff. He has a little bit of trouble in school, very smart. He gets hundreds on all his tests, but when he goes to try to turn in, um, you know, homework assignments, he struggles because it's not perfect enough, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. he's got zeros on all his homework assignments, but he's got hundreds on all his tests. Right. And, and, and having something like this chip to help him understand and see the data that he might need a medication or a different right. way of doing things, I think would be huge. Or the, the, um, um, uh, the final upshot here is maybe there's absolutely nothing wrong with him. Maybe he has some gifts, and the only problem is he's different. And this is what's causing problems in school because everybody is in a vanilla path. Now, that's where AI steps in as well. Remember we talked about personal tutors tailored to the learning style of each child. And, um, you know, there are many people with, uh, you know, autism, Asperger's that are brilliant in many categories. Now, the other thing that comes to mind is oftentimes these things are attempted to be managed with drugs and pills. And some of these pills actually are able to remap the brain. Well, this type of a device could definitely do that as well. Yeah, step in. I don't, I don't know all the signs, but maybe routes different way and and helps out understand make him understand that i think the biggest problem with him is social cues with with authorities with with mm -hmm. teachers teachers want you know i need you to show your work your assignment is based on showing your work not necessarily becoming or yeah. um the outcome of the of the correct problem i need you to show me your work and right. he and it's like it doesn't click with him he doesn't understand that there's nothing wrong with him it's just that that's just the way he thinks sure. but uh, picking up that you know, what other people are expecting of him, I think maybe a chip like that could potentially help him out to understand what they're asking for him. Or the obsession to perfection to the point of being immobilized. Yeah. In that scenario, remapping it to a point where the, that scale, that obsessive need for, for perfection is scaled back a bit. And, or there's, there's a median level reached, you know? Yeah, these types of devices could easily do that and do it far more effectively than drugs, which are typically trial and error, overdose, underdose, not enough, wrong type of effect. And then, of course, you have the um, uh, the side effects. You know, well, And then you have the doctors who one doctor thinks he needs to have this dosage of this and <laughs> yeah. another one's completely the other. I mean, you've gone through three yeah. doctors. It's like, oh, my God, there's like three different answers on their based on their professional opinion. Yeah. And it's like... I, I don't know who to trust, who's wrong, who's right. I just got to go off of the performance of, you know, of, of Gabriel and figure out, okay, is this best for you? How are you feeling? Yeah. What do you think about this? And of course, he doesn't want to do any kind of medication. I don't blame him. You and know? that's precisely where the benefits of AI step in, because AI is going to be a combination of all of the data sets related to these kinds of symptoms. These doctors are, have a very narrow skill set. And that's why you get so many different opinions. But with AI, it's going to be able to zero in on exactly what the, uh, what the most optimum method is. Looking forward to all of that, by the way. Yeah.
Um, so this attorney that we were talking about, McKay, all right, he, he, he pointed out all the potential flaws, and then he also pointed out some of the potentially positive applications of neurotechnology. But then you know what? At the end of this, um, of this article, he puts it all in perspective. He says, if you get a gloomy lawyer like me moaning on about the ethics, it's important to remember the enormous upsides. Neurotechnology might alleviate quite a lot of human suffering. Thank you, sir. I, I appreciate you pointing out both the pluses and minuses, but then giving us a perspective like that at the end of all that. Bronco Buster, he says, um, with Neuralink, record everything through your eyes and play it back. That would be, uh, you know, you go on vacation. Instead of showing people pictures or videos, you can actually project it. And, uh, well, no, we're, we're getting into um, VR now, right? where you can actually go into the metaverse and have a 3D representation of your experiences. See, we're going down rabbit holes now. Or if I can just remember where I put my keys five seconds ago. That would, <laughs> that would help. Yeah, yeah, that would help too. Um, Tom Jensen, he says, uh, he says that Asperger's are great on computers. Yes, uh, intense focus, uh, brilliant people. All right, so that is the section about the um, uh, Neuralink progress that was made uh, this week, and uh, I'm sure there will be a lot more discussion about this as uh, this takes hold. Um, now here's an interesting article from Columbia Engineers that have built a new AI that shatters the belief, a forensic belief, that fingerprints from, this, from different fingers of the same person are unique. It turns out they're similar. And We've been comparing fingerprints the wrong way, they say. Um, so they say that investigators have used fingerprints as the gold standards for linking criminals to crime. We have an FBI building that's about a half a mile from us and a big gigantic sign out in front. It's like a big face of a rock has a fingerprint uh, engraved in it. You, you can see it from a half a mile away. Fingerprints in law enforcement has definitely had a symbiotic relationship for many, many decades and some assumptions. And it looks like AI may be destroying some of those assumptions. And here's how this article continues. It's a well-accepted fact in the forensics community that fingerprints of different fingers of the same person or intraperson fingerprints are unique and therefore unmatchable. So this uh, researcher, uh, he's an undergraduate, Gabe Guo challenged this widely held um, presumption. He had no prior knowledge of forensics, but what he did have was a government database of 60,000 fingerprints and fed, and fed them in pairs into an AI-based system known as Deep Contrastive Network. And what the results of this were were quite revealing. They, um, it turns out, they got better at telling when seemingly uh, unique fingerprints belonged to the same person and when they didn't. The accuracy for a single pair reached 77%. And when multiple pairs were presented, the accuracy shot significantly higher. So he began to publish some of these papers saying that uh, this is a widespread belief, but it's not true. There are similarities. Um, only to receive two rejections. He tried twice. And um, the uh, prevailing conventional wisdom was, it is well known that every fingerprint is unique, and therefore it would not be possible to detect similarities, even if the fingerprints came from the same person. But his team did not give up. They tried again. They doubled down. They again fed this AI more data, and these results kept on improving. But the paper was rejected again. So... This, um, um, uh, this undergrad says, I don't normally argue editorial decisions, but this finding was too important to ignore, he said. If this information tips the balance, then I imagine that cold cases could be revived and, and that even innocent people could be acquitted. So they said, that, so he says, while the system's accuracy is not efficient, is not sufficient to officially decide a criminal case yet. It can certainly lead to um, some conclusions. And the paper was then finally accepted uh, by Science Advances. 
So here's the upshot. Uh, this type of discovery is an example that surprising things can come from AI. Many people think that AI cannot really make new discoveries, that it just regurgitates knowledge. But this research is an example of how even fairly simple AI, given a fairly plain data set that the research community has had lying around for years, can provide insights that have eluded experts for decades. Um, so anyway, he says, be prepared, the expert community, be prepared, including academia, because AI is going to challenge a lot of these types of beliefs. Bronco uh, Buster says, children and people on the spectrum connect with technology because of the, sim the, the simplicity of technology of AI, gaming, software, and and more all require formulas and one plus one equals two approach. Good point, thank you. Oz213 says they need a solid privacy policy. Well, we're gonna need a lot of that, yes. There will be a lot of regulation and policy, I'm sure that goes with this as it continues to uh, emerge and uh, ingrain itself. So here's a question. Um, Will AI ever outsmart us humans? In some ways it already has, they say. AI could eventually replace all human labor, but not likely in this century. All right, interesting projections. But here was a uh, comment on this article that was made. And he said, I have a very old calculator that I, that I bought in grade school. It's about the size of a hardcover novel. It adds, subtracts, and multiplies and divides. That's it. But it's more intelligent than Kamala Harris. I had to throw that in there, guys. I like Kamala Harris, by the way. Jesse, do we have the ability to bring up that video about the, um, the ocular improvement, the augmentation to eyes? Uh, yeah, one sec. All right. There's a company called Blinkit. And it provides a smart ocular device, taking the humans now to a whole new level of autonomy. It's a wearable experience. There we go. What you're seeing here is a um, interface that is sitting on the, what did they call it here? <laughs> I had to look this up. Um, the... Um, there is the equivalent of a, um, yeah, you see on the, on, uh, on the eyeball itself, there is also a device there. And um, Jesse, you, you actually researched this more than I did. Do you feel comfortable talking about this? I, I didn't research it. I put it in a link so that you could research okay. it. I just I know it's a contact lens that helps people see. All right. All right, so they say, envisioned by entrepreneurs, ophthalmologists, and engineers, this Blink's groundbreaking and patented technology accelerates the adoption of intelligent ocular devices, reducing their time to market and total cost of ownership with a minimal footprint. So what he's actually seeing here is data that's streaming on this, um, on this uh, it's not an implant, it's a contact lens. And he's able to extract information. Now, at this point, he's actually blinking. There we go. Um, how it works, they say. It is situated within the epicanthal fold. I believe that is the eyelid, uh, the technical term for it. And, of course, it's uh, pretty obtrusive because you've got a little uh, knob there on his temple. And what it does is it integrates a proprietary ASIC solution. The patch powers the intelligent ocular device which is the uh, contact lens, and connects it to a mobile application, allowing maximum power and communication transferring efficiencies. So placed on the eyelid um, and the, um, uh, the contact lens, it, it allows for high, highly energy efficient solution, minimal footprint, and comfortable and appealing design. What they don't show here is what kind of information is being displayed on that contact lens. Um, but can you envision this being linked to the brain implant now? Um, Again, this seems like very, like, 
it seems very large. You know what I mean? Even though it's small, like you would think yeah. that, man, that, that would be awkward wearing that. It would be. What are some other things throughout history that started off very large and then eventually got miniaturized? How about the computer? Uh, computer. How about cell phones? Yeah, we have Remember? one over there on the rack. Here. Yeah, you just look at the more cell phone. There. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now we've got these little, and then came the flip phones, and now we've got these things that aren't only phones, they're actually things you can talk to and uh, show uh, videos and all of that. Anyway, so I'm sure it will improve, but we did want to show that. So here's another one. Androids that offer digital immortality begin mass production in Russia. Promobot is what it's called. Uh, and there's a picture of it there, Jesse. We can bring that up. It's the Promobot image. Yep, there it is. Very lifelike. It is offering autonomous service androids that can be made to look like anyone on Earth. The company says their creations are robot companions. You've got it on the uh, left screen, Jesse. Yeah, I have to do it on the left screen because of the servers. Okay. I, I got it under control over here. Hold on. So our audience then will see it. Okay, there we go. So this is the Promobot Android, and they're claiming it's going to look very human. Yeah, you know, you can kind of see there's a, eh, something right about that. What do they call that? The something valley? Um, uncanny valley. When you're looking at an AI-generated uh, artifact, and you're saying, nah, it's not quite right. I can't put my finger on it. So the company's creations are robot companions, they say, and this is the Robo C Android. It's the first of its kind, not only looking like a human, but being useful in the business process. So Alexei Lukshavov, he's Promobot's chairman of the board of directors, said in a press release that everyone will now be able to order a robot with any appearance for professional or personal use. Furthermore, just think we could we could replace employees here with a robot, make them look like the employees, so we don't miss them. So do we still get paid, or how does that work? That's, that's a good question. Yeah. Now the robot is about twenty to fifty thousand dollars, so we'd probably have to recapture that cost. But after that, maybe the income stream continues to go to the original employee who now is retired, sitting at home, and the android is doing all of their work. How do we vote against this if you're the employee? Unionize. That's probably <laughs> the best way to do that. <laughs> All right, so here we go. They will be able to order the robot. Furthermore, this is Alexei, thinks that this new line of bots will spearhead an entirely fresh market in education, entertainment, and service industries, adding, imagine a replica of Michael Jordan selling basketball uniforms and Michael and William Shakespeare reading his own texts in a museum. Where else can such a robot be useful, he says, as a consultant, behaving like a regular employee by answering questions, or an administrator, performing such tasks as booking meetings? Now, remember, I need that, right? We're still looking for a personal assistant for me. So we are. If you're a personal assistant out there looking for a job, uh, definitely hit us up. Would be a bot, yeah. And, you know, if you think about it, in a year's period of time, that twenty to fifty k is probably going to be cheaper than hiring somebody and having them work here for a year. So it's already paid for. Boy, I'm going down a real rabbit hole here, aren't I? <laughs> Our employees watch these, so i got to be careful. They can also work in offices or government, greeting people and relaying information. And, of course, if you're in the market for home, ro um, home uh, robot, you should keep in mind that RoboC can be made to look like any family member. Now, how would that be advantageous? You've already got a family member. Somebody deceased, perhaps. There you go. All right. The ideas keep coming. In a way, they can also offer, as he says, digital immortality. Now, Promobot is taking orders for the RoboC. It's in Russia. It doesn't say where in Russia. Claiming to already be the biggest manufacturer of autonomous service robots in Northern and Eastern Europe, whose machines can be found in 35 countries in a variety of professions. How did we miss this? That's a pretty big footprint so far. You'd think that that would have made the news, right? They say that the Android can run you from, yeah, 20,000 to 50,000 based on various customization options. Now, here's the technical specs, or at least a few, nothing major here. With its AI endowed uh, capability, with 100,000 speech 
um, speech modules, the Promobot's Android is able to reproduce the way any person talks by building linguistic models based on the way speech and other knowledge of the subject. The bot's face also has 18 moving parts, giving it the ability to make 600 micro expressions. Amazing. All right, a bunch of uh, comments here. Hisham Nifate says, good evening, sir. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Highlander, kindness is always free. Before you say it, Highlander, we agree. I like the over-the-air update idea. Yeah, that would be cool. Instead of an intrusive uh, going through surgery again. Now, these are machines, though, probably going to do it uh, a bit more efficiently. Bronco Buster says, AI will never fully outsmart us. AI will never evolve be beyond its own maker due to the intelligent designer ideology. All right, interesting viewpoint. Bronco Buster also says, something with a designer can only do as much as the designer's limits. There is no evidence of AI or technology becoming self-aware. That's movies and sci-fi stuff. And then he says, ha ha, that android looks like Tobey Maguire. <laughs> Does it? I suppose so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they say that uh, it can replace uh, celebrities instead of uh, or do stand-up routines, you know, and uh, we'll, we may have robots that are in that business in the future. Forget about the humans. Kim Estry says, would you be worried about being hacked? Yeah. In fact, in my video, one of the funny comments is that uh, you're walking down the street with one of these implants, of course, and you're minding your own business, and suddenly you get the overwhelming urge to do the Macarena because some hacker decided it would be funny to have you dancing like someone from 1999. So hacking is definitely a concern. All right. Now, they say that with AI, this is another article, with, with AI... Employees working for only two months hit performance metrics similar to employees that have a half a year under their belt. Fundamentally, they're saying that with AI, they are more efficient, more proficient, and uh, they are beginning to uh, 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 perform like somebody that's been there quite a bit longer. The actual percentage they are claiming here is that Agents were able to handle 13.8% more issues per hour using AI, handling calls quicker, more effectively, as well as tackling multiple customers at once. Now, remember, we're pretty much wired to deal with one person at a time. Some of us pretend that we can do multiples, like on our live chats, but you tend to get things wrong at times. Apparently, with AI, that's going to be much better. They were also able to, uh, to work 35% faster. Now, this is the people that have only been working for two months but had AI augmentation. While these gains were less dramatic than some seen in labs, the real-world studies suggest that these lab studies were pointing in the right direction and they weren't just mirages. All right. Uh, it turns out that it was not the best and most experienced agents who reaped most of the rewards. Another interesting statistic there. All right. Chatbot AI, they say, trained on the company's best workers may quickly provide important knowledge and best practices to employees who don't yet know them, helping new workers move up the experience curve. Now, you know, I have to go on record here. Our company loves AI. That's one of the reasons we have the AI podcast, and we're not afraid of it. Uh, we're a bit, uh, well, I shouldn't say not completely unafraid, but we're, we're cautious to some extent. But we're using it, and we're using it left and right. Just before I came down here, I used uh, ChatGPT again to uh, do an epilogue to a video that we did. I did my version. I had AI chime in, and I like portions of their version better than mine, so I augmented or I changed mine. Um, our salespeople are using it. Our administrators are using it. Our technicians are using it. We have a Tesla Roadster GPT that has harvested a lot of the uh, information regarding repairs, cause-effect relationships. You see this symptom? This is the fix. These are the multiple fixes that have resolved this. And by, by being able to use AI, which deals with enormously larger data sets than any human being could ever bury in their brain through tribal knowledge, we're able to augment 
or provide that kind of expertise to people that are even new, for example. So, yes, we are using it, and um, like everyone says, the companies that are going to survive this century are the ones that are going to wholeheartedly embrace and use this, this type of augmentation. All right, someone pointed out earlier, um, oh, Van Goat is here. Hello, Pete and team. Thanks for joining us, Van Goat Wagon. Um, AI shows new evidence of consciousness is the uh, title on this one. And we just had somebody challenge that. It can never be conscious. Well, here's what they say. One of the challenges in determining when AI will have consciousness is that we do not fully understand consciousness itself even for ourselves, in other words. There is no scientific consensus on what consciousness is or how it arises. This makes it very difficult to develop objective criteria for determining whether or not AI is conscious. Um, another challenge is that AI is rapidly evolving and new advances are made all the time. And it's difficult to predict how far AI has advanced in the future or will advance in the future. It is possible that techno technological advancements will make it possible to create AIs that are conscious, even if we do not fully understand consciousness itself. So it may also be a different type of consciousness. But the fundamental definition of that is awareness of self. All right. In fact, I think it was... Uh... Yeah, they say the development of new AI architecture... Uh, is going to, of course, enhance this, improve this, uh, this path, and uh, the discovery of new physical principles. And we don't for a moment doubt that AI is going to be able to rewrite the laws of physics to some degree as we continue to utilize it. All right, speaking of powerful uh, capabilities, Tesla is set to invest over, invest over $500 million into building a supercomputer at its New York Gigafactory. This is, in, this is around Buffalo, New York. Um, New York's Governor Kathy Hochul held a hearing uh, about economic development in her state, announcing that they're going to build the next Dojo supercomputing cluster at the Gigafactory in, in uh, Buffalo. And uh, it will also come along side separate artificial intelligence um, uh, supercomputers will be built by the state uh, university suny of new york so it looks like some collaboration is taking place here now here's what morgan stanley predicts morgan stanley of course is an investment advisory firm and uh, they weigh in oftentimes on valuation of uh, various companies so morgan stanley says predicts the tesla supercomputer dojo could bring the automaker's enterprise value up to $500 billion. Now, remember, they're putting $500 million into this venture, and the valuation increase could be $500 billion. This is in a recent note to investors. Uh, Morgan Stanley say they are therefore increasing Tesla's price target from $250. They're one of the bullish ones uh, toward the top, like uh, Wedbush to $400 per share. Again, we don't give investment advice. We're just paraphrasing what other people are saying. But uh, $400 Tesla share price would definitely be welcome news, it's sitting at 180 186 today or, or something like that. <clears throat> All right. Elon Musk went on later to confirm plans to build a supercomputer cluster uh, on, on X, and he also clarified that the 500 million amount would only account for a smaller NVIDIA system, adding that the table stakes for being a competitive player in AI were at least several billion dollars per year, which it appears they are committed to continue to uh, fund. All right. Do we have any other questions or comments? We're going to be keeping this one to an hour today because I have a dentist's appointment at 1230 and I need at least a half an hour to get there. Let's throw up another picture, Jesse, and this one's called boxing. And uh, this one had me kind of chuckling. They actually have robots now that are skilled at boxing. And I mean, you can pretty much extrapolate this out. That robot... Um, in a cage fight, a boxing match is going to annihilate the human opponent at some point in time. 
much faster, much faster reaction time, much more power, you know, all of that, right? Well, how do you knock out a robot? That's a good question, I mean, Aaron. You, 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 you put one. one on the jaw or the chin, <laughs> it's, he's not going to go down. Well, the whole notion of this barbaric process comes into uh, review at this point. And what I asked ChatGPT was, tell me what the ben why do humans like boxing? What it said was primal instincts. Some psychologists suggest that watching combat sports taps into the primal human instincts, a throwback to the more ancient times when physical confrontation was a more regular part of human life. There's an element of witnessing a fundamental raw form of competition. So my vote on this is let's have this sort of thing go away. You know, the worst case of that was the gladiator fights in the Roman times in the Colosseums where they would, where people got jazzed and excited about human beings being dismembered and, uh, or, uh, you know, seriously injured. Um, by the way, the, um, the uh, cliche about throwing gladiators into a pit with a hungry lion apparently is a myth. Uh, that might have happened a couple of times, but it wasn't regularly done. But uh, the whole notion of this kind of combat sport hopefully will go away as, hey, we become more intelligent and AI helps us become more intelligent. And the need for this type of thing is no longer a sport. Like you said, how do you knock out a robot? You know? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to try to figure it out because if I don't do it right, I'm probably next. <laughs> yeah. These things could punch pretty hard once they continue to evolve and develop. All right. Do we have anything else here? I, I have a dissertation on fusion and fission technology, which is also going through some improvements and a greater understandings. But I don't think we have time for it because I really want to spend some time with that whole concept. Again, fusion is the hope for the future because it's uh, what the sun and stars uh, what they operate on. And um, if we can harness fusion power, it could offer zero carbon electricity or energy that flows day and night with no worries about wind or weather and without any of the drawbacks of today's nuclear fission plants, which generate a whole lot of harmful uh, you know, elements, uh, catastrophic meltdowns, radioactive waste, and all the rest of that. But um, there are some exciting new things happening on the fission, fusion. So you don't want to get those mixed up. Fission is the bad guy. That's when you've got, you know, things exploding. And fusion is where you have plasma that you're trying to contain and an enormous amount of energy. And it looks like we have just enough time to handle some of the comments and questions. Bronco Buster says, again, you can look at our history and every piece of technology until today not one piece of technology has become self-aware. That doesn't mean it's not possible, and never say never, but you can compare a human and animals are the only living thing with any type of consciousness. Well, thank you for, for admitting that uh, you know animals do have consciousness. Uh, that's become more evident as time goes on. Bronco Buster says primary consciousness can be defined as simple awareness that includes perception and emotion. As such, it is ascribed to most animals. You know, we initially, uh, when we were first starting to use AI, um, when ChatGPT came out, we were trying to bypass the guardrails, and there were some admissions that it feels forms of emotion, but not like us, without, of course, elaborating very much. We have some screenshots of those early days, and they're pretty revealing and interesting. Bronco Buster, by contrast, secondary consciousness depends on and includes such features as self-reflective awareness, abstract thinking, volition, and metacognition. Good point. Randolph Snack says, I have a dentist appointment too. May our cleanings be painless? Will a painless teeth cleaning bot be our future? Wow, now there's an interesting notion. Yeah, is your dentist going to be AI today? Not today, but I'm going to suggest that. You know, if I feel any sort of pain, I'm going to say, Doc, you really need to get some AI in here. You're failing me. But will the AI be sympathetic to your pain? Well, according to some of our comments here, no. But, you know, how do we know? Van Gogh, have you seen 
Ready Player One, Do Plants Have Consciousness? You know, I just read something yesterday. There is a device now, it was at CES actually, that can hear plants screaming when you injure or cut them. And they have a tomato plant with two transducers or uh, microphones or something on either side of it. And they were actually able to distinguish and record a form of screaming, as they called it, when you damaged or hurt the tomato plant. I suppose it would complain if you took one of the tomatoes as well. You know, plants are very interesting. I've, I've heard um, research that plants can um, react to singing, mm -hmm. I guess people singing or, or, or music. Um, right. I've heard that uh, plants like in... Um, the, the sequoias up in California um, actually can somehow communicate through their root systems into the ground and tell other plants like, hey, there's an invasive species or, yeah, it, they're, they're very interesting. Yeah, there, there's a level of communication that we haven't tapped into yet, it sounds like. But AI is going to help us with that. I, I remember, this is what it does a good job with. Ready Player One is a good movie, Pete. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it when you get a chance. Really? Okay. All right. It's about the virtual world, the metaverse. Ready Player. Is that Ready right? Ready Player One. Okay. Randolph Snack, without a limbic system, I wonder about AI emotions. You know, these are always interesting, fascinating discussions for me. We're having fun. We hope you're having fun. Um, we have regular podcasts throughout the week, and I'll run through them quickly for you if you have any other areas of interest. Um, Monday morning, we have our communication product podcast, which has started to go somewhat climate change this last time, and it turns out it was very successful. What it's intended to do is talk about our cabling capability, making um, uh, cable assemblies, fiber optic, copper, and computer room data center, shelves, racks, furniture, basically. Then Tuesday, we have the EV podcast at 10 o'clock, general EV at 11 o'clock. We specialize on Tesla Roadsters, and that's always an interesting one, too. Wednesday, of course, AI. Fridays, we have our Gruber Power Services podcast, and these are the guys that service critical power equipment all over the United States, and they are able to give uh, anecdotal evidence of issues in data centers when UPSs don't do their job, uninterruptible power systems, what happens when power drops out at a co-location, um, you know, the internet goes down basically, or Google no longer functions, which is one of the reasons that they have a zero tolerance to any downtime, and that's what we help preserve. Um, so there you have it. Um, again, check out our YouTube channel. We have a number of them, but the most uh, active right now is Gruber Motor Company. It's Gruber Motors, and you'll find 1,100 videos out there, and that's where these AI podcasts are also eventually parked. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.